Bibles and open up to Ephesians chapter number 3. And we'll remain standing out of honor to the word of the Lord as we read this. Read a few verses here, then we'll pray. And then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Ephesians chapter number 3. We'll begin in uh, verse number 13. Ephesians chapter number 3. Uh, beginning in verse number 13. So Ephesians chapter 3. In verse number 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And let's pray, dear Father, I pray that you'll be with us this morning. Father, I pray that you'll use me during this time. Father, I pray that you'll give me the words to say, not anything that I have to say, not my thoughts, but your thoughts. Father, I pray that you'll use me. Father, as you know my heart, I desire not just to fill a time. I desire to be a help and to be used of you. So, Father, I pray that you'll use this, this sermon, this passage this morning to help challenge and to change lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Seated. Thank you. Pretty, pretty famous, uh, 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 pretty famous um, vessel, pretty famous story uh, that goes along with it. But Apollo 13 uh, was a lunar landing space mission. So basically meaning it was a mission to go into space, land on the moon, come back home. That's what that means. Uh, and it's become probably one of the most well-known missions to space, so much that movies and books and and, and Legends have come about from this one singular mission. Uh, after liftoff, everything went off as it should. Nothing was wrong. Everything was great. Uh, until they uh, reached into the outer space and they were on their way to the moon, uh, they had a electrical short uh, somewhere in, in the spacecraft that set off a chain reaction that would eventually result in one of their oxygen tanks exploding inside the main spacecraft. Now, obviously, they're already in outer space. They're no longer in the Earth's orbit or anything like that. Uh, they're already on the way to the moon uh, when this happened. Obviously, oxygen, pretty important. Uh, so when their oxygen tank exploded, there were many implications that were immediate problems for those men, for those astronauts that were on that spacecraft. Obviously, first and foremost, breathing. Uh, because if they go a few minutes without oxygen, they will die. Now, obviously, that was not all the oxygen that was on the spacecraft, but that was, you know, the main deal. Um, and one of the other things is that that was their main uh, means of propulsion. So when that oxygen tank exploded, now they're not only losing oxygen very quickly, but they're also now pretty much dead in the water in outer space, for the most part. Their main vessel is pretty much just a floating duck in outer space, which is, you know, a wonderful thing when you have a very limited supply of water and oxygen and things like that. So as soon as the explosion took place, the crew of Apollo 13 reached out to Miss Control and stated the very fateful and famous words, Houston, we've had a problem. Which, I mean, a little bit of an understatement when, you know, you really understand the full implications of the whole deal. Yeah, we've had a problem. You know, it sounds like, you know, they spilled the water or something like that. Ah, uh, no, the oxygen tank exploded in their main spacecraft. Immediately, NASA Mission Control flew into action. Moon's landing was now at the back of everyone's mind. It wasn't even an option anymore. This is what the whole mission was. This is why they spent millions and thousands and billions of dollars of trying to have this space mission was to land on the moon. And now that wasn't even in anyone's mind in NASA Mission Control. The only important thing to them was to bring the men home. That was their only deal. That was their only mission. So the crew hunkered into 
the two-person craft that was used specifically for the moon landing. Because the main craft now was close. It was done. There was nothing they could do about it. They didn't have the they didn't have the, the tools, they didn't have the repair parts to fix the main vessel. So they, all of them, crammed into the two-man vessel. Two-man vessel that was supposed to go to the moon, be there for a day or two, come back, and then they would pitch back up with the main spacecraft and come back to planet Earth. That obviously did not happen. So now the main spacecraft is done. It's cooked. There's nothing they can do about it. So the three of the three astronauts cram into the two-man vessel that is stocked and prepared for two days. For two men, for two days. That's what the, the moon landing craft is for. But now you have three men in there, and it has to last them four days, because that's how long it's going to take for them to get back to planet Earth. So now you have major problems, because now they're going longer than the space that craft is supposed to be used, and... They have another man in the spacecraft, so they have even less time. They had two days if they had two men, but now they have an extra body in there, an extra man in there, so they have less than two days' worth of supplies, oxygen, and everything they need to survive. So this is obviously a very dire situation. So the crew now had to fly home in the vehicle that was designed for two men for two days, not three men for four days. And obviously, they had many obstacles that arose on the way. And what they actually did back at NASA Mission Control is they went to a conference room or some office, and they literally got a box and filled it with everything that those three astronauts had at their disposal on their tiny spacecraft. And they literally put it in the box, they took it in the room, and they dumped it on the table and said, gentlemen, this is what we have to work with. We need to figure something out that they can survive an extra two and a half days out of this stuff. And we're talking like duct tape, we're talking paper, we're talking cardboard, stuff like that. Like, not like crazy, you know, ooh, wow, such cool stuff. We're talking like bare bones, like, you know, hillbilly type stuff. And they have to make an invention, something that's going to help preserve or at least extend their oxygen supply long enough to help them make it all the way back home. Obviously, the men at NASA Control and the scientists at NASA Control worked tirelessly around the clock, non-stop, trying every way to devise, a, uh, to devise a solution. And then, once they devised a solution, then they had to meticulously walk through the astronauts on how to do what they just did. Okay, you have to do this. You have to cut it this big. You have to make sure it goes in exactly like this. Because if they didn't, then it wasn't going to work. And so this is a very long painstaking, meticulous process. But one of the most obvious things when you hear the stories or you read the books or you watch the adaptations of it, one of the things that you, that you glean from it is you get this idea. Although the words were never actually stated in real life, I believe it's said in some of the uh, movies or, or such or in some of the books, the words were not actually said, but the sentiment rings true that the men that were involved with this mission had the mindset of failure is not an option. It was not to them, what are we going to do when we fail? What are we going to do if we can't get them home? No, it was, how are we going to get them home? There was never a question of, what are we going to do if we don't work it out? No, the question was, we're going to find a way to work it out, and we're going to bring them back home. That was their mindset. Failure to them was not an option. And I'm sure those astronauts greatly appreciated their sentiment and their, their, their tenacity to say failure is not an option. No one went home. No one took breaks. It was constant round-the-clock work trying to, uh, trying to save those three astronauts alive for an impossible feat. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, we go back to our text. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. If we faint not, as born-again Christians, 
those that have trusted Christ to be our Savior, if we faint not, we need to have the mentality. If it's going to be our goal of saying, I will not faint, I will stand before my Savior, and I will say, I fainted not, then the mentality has to be, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul reminds the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, what God has done. What has God done? The things God has done. In chapter 2, Paul reminds that before God saved us and that God desires that everyone be saved. And that everyone do what he would have them do for their lives. These are the things Paul is trying to do. He's trying to lead them on in the way. He said, look, this is what God has done. This is where you were. This is what God did for you. And now he's saying, okay, with that in mind, let's get that mentality of we will not fail. We cannot fail. God has given us a great commission. God has given us a job, and we don't have the option to fail. Failure isn't even on the table. It's not even an option. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be going around a different place in our Bible this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I had been in the deep. In journeyings, often in perils of water, in perils of robber, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. What is Paul doing? Paul is listing all the things. This is my pedigree. These are all the things I have been through. What is he trying to say? He said, look, God allowed me to make it through these things. And then at the very end, he says, look, despite all the things that I've gone through, I daily have the burden of caring for all the churches. That was something that was daily on Paul's mind, was all of the people he had led to Christ and all the churches that he had, that God had used him to start. And he had that on his mind of wondering and praying and caring for them because he also knew. Paul was very acquainted with the fact that every time he left the city, there were people that followed him and would then preach the exact opposite thing that Paul preached. The Bible even talks about in the book of Acts saying that that's what they did. That was their mission, was to follow Paul around and try and turn everyone away from what Paul just taught them. So Paul had this understanding, but Paul also knew he had to follow the Lord's leading. That when God said, it's time to go, Paul, he had to trust that God knew what he was doing, and he would go. But Paul is trying to teach the the people at Corinth here, the church at Corinth, he's trying to teach them, look, yeah, I went through all these things. Yeah, God, God took me through all these things, but I did not faint. I did not allow it to stop me. I did not allow it to, to, to put me down and to put me in subjection. I, by God's grace, kept going forward. Second Timothy 4, 7. Paul said to Timothy, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What is he trying to say? Is it Timothy, he knew, Paul knew. His time on earth was coming to a close. He knew his his days on earth were numbered. He knew it was only a matter of time before he was going to be executed. And so he's telling Timothy, he says, Timothy, I know I have done what God wanted me to do. I know I stayed faithful to my father. I fought my fort. I fought the fight. I finished my course. What God had for me, I did it. I did not faint. I kept the faith. He's trying to tell Timothy, he says, Timothy, if I was able to do it, I know you can. I know you're able to, Timothy. That's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, look, if I, if God can use me, then God will most definitely use you. In 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. We're pretty close to there. Let's flip there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says this, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we, receive, as we have received mercy, we faint not. He's saying we've been given a ministry. We've been given a job. But we cannot faint. Once again, we have to have that mindset of those National Mission Control members and scientists of saying failure is not an option. When I stand before Christ, I have to be able to say failure was not on the menu. Failure was not an option in my mind. I made a resolution that I would give all and use all, and I would not faint. Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Paul is trying to teach us that, look, just like planting crops. You plant a crop, it doesn't poof, pop up in five minutes later. No, it's a labor of love. It takes months. It can take uh, weeks, months to get that reap. To have that bountiful harvest, and God says, if you faint not, it'll come to you. But you have to have that mindset of failure is not an option. I, I cannot be half-hearted in my effort to serve the Lord. I, I cannot be wishy-washy sitting on the fence post of deciding, do I want to do this? Once again, if those men at NASA Control didn't have that mindset of failure is not an option, those astronauts never would have made it home. If it was a take it or leave it, I'd, I'd take my 15 minutes every eight hours. Uh, they, they would not have made it home because it took an all-in effort of everyone getting everything they had, of everyone saying failure is not an option. So I will not stop until success is had. But yet we have a commission from the king, from the king of kings, the lord of lords, and we treat his commands as if, ah, God understands God knows I'm busy. I've got things going on in my life. I'm a busy person. I've got things going on. Oh, I'm sure God understands. You know, he's the one that sent his son, the perfect one. So we could have a chance to live with him. So we could have a chance to live with him. And God's supposed to understand that I'm busy. I've got things going on. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in mind. What is he saying? He said, think, think of Christ. Think of Christ. He lived on this earth amongst the filth, and he never did wrong. Not because not because he's so not because of this or that. It's because he desired to be the spotless lamb. He desired to be the one that says, "I will carry you to the Father. I will be the bridge so you can go to the Father." That's what Christ's mission was, and He's the one that did not faint. So I know I have the ability of failure is not an option because Christ said failure is not an option for me. Christ said, I, I cannot fail. My mission is too great. My mission is too important. I, I have too much riding on this. The souls of mankind. And failure was not an option. And Paul is trying to remind us, consider him. Who endures this contradiction of sinners against himself. Remember, Christ was vehemently accused. Vehemently accused for days. He stood on trial of accusation, and the whole time, he opened not his mouth. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine standing there for hours upon hours upon hours and having people lie against you, have people make stuff up against you, and you just sit there and just, oh, if that was us, oh, how dare you? You lying about me. But Christ opened not his mouth. In fact, the only time he did was when they said, Are you the Son of God? Thou sayest it. 
Oh, then, then they lost their minds at that time. You thought they were crazy before that. They, whew, they went crazy. Uh, it reminds me of, of the Pharisees with, with uh, Stephen. When he goes through, he tells them all the history of the people of God. And the Bible says they, they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were so mad at him. They were still starting to grind their teeth. They were like, oh, I can't stand this guy. Because he would not falter. He would not faint. He would not, there is the definition of the word to faint, is to vanish, to fail, to be weak, to decay. That, that's not what Christ was. Christ says, I, I cannot vanish. I cannot fail. There's too much writing on my job, on my mission. To be weary to the place of not fulfilling our God-given task on this earth. That's not the mindset of failure is not an option. There are four things in our text that Paul was trying to teach and tell the church and the Christians at Ephesus. Four things we see, and each one of them are set off by the word that. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter number 3, and we'll begin reading in verse number 16. Four things. The remedy to faint not. That's what he says in verse 13. He said, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not. So then he goes on to help them understand how... Do you faint not? That you be this, that you be this, that you be this, and that you be this. So let's look at those four things. Verse number 16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. The first thing, if failure is not an option, I have to be strengthened in the inner man. The inner man. There's the outer man the inner man. There, 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 there's the old man and the new man. Which one is going to be strengthened? You see, as we grow older, our physical bodies will begin to faint. They'll begin to decay. That's just, that's just part of life. Under the curse of sin that we live, our bodies begin to decay, and there's nothing you can do about that. That's the curse of sin. Despite uh, uh, Bill Gates and Google, in, uh, Google, one of one of Google's get this, one of their ma- one of their main directives of Google is to cure death. Your web browser is trying to cure death. Good luck. <laughs> They're never going to succeed. No matter how that's that's why uh, cryogenics is such a big thing. You know, freezing your dead body because one day they might bring me back from the dead. Right. Yeah. Hopefully, don't break your finger off when they're pulling you out. Ooh, my bad. Sorry. Ah, didn't mean to do that. They believe they can conquer death. That will not happen. We have the curse of sin. Your body will decay, and there's nothing you can do. Well, the only thing you can do about your body not decaying is die young. Okay. Uh, but then your body will decay because you're dead. Sorry, it's a lose lose situation. Our earthly bodies, our physical bodies will faint. But the inner man should be the opposite. The inner man, the soul, is one that will live forever. And it's your choice whether or not the inner man will have strength or will have weakness. But there's nothing you can do about your physical body. Oh, you can work on you. You can try and keep it strong, but it will fail. It will begin to degrade. There's nothing you can do about it. But the inner man, there's everything you can do about that. That It is resilient, and it will never die. So it's your choice as to how strong the inner man will be. See, as we grow in age, it should be the opposite. As we grow in age, our, our physical body begins to decay and begins to die and begins to wear down. But the opposite should happen with the inner man. As I grow older, my inner man should be strengthened. I should learn more about God, and the more I learn about God, the stronger the inner man should be, because I am learning more about what God has done, more about what God will do, and my trust in Him and my strength in Him should grow 
every day, every year, I grow older, the inner man should be stronger. Day by day, step by step, the inner man should be strengthened. As the physical man begins to die, the inner man should be strengthened. The outer man, the body, there's nothing you can do. It will decay and die. There's nothing you can do. But the inner man should be strengthened as you walk with the Lord. So we do not faint because we have the strengthened inner man. Paul is trying to teach him. He says, look, I, I, that you faint not. That's what he's trying to say. Faint not. And so he says that you be strengthened by the Lord in the inner man. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's what he's saying. We as a people are, are, are in rapt about our appearance. It's fantastically amazing how much money we spend on our appearance. The cosmetic surgery industry, get this, not cosmetics. People going under the knife to change their body to something that is more pleasing to them or what they think will be more pleasing to others. The Grandview Research says that by 2025, they predict, so next year, they predict that this industry will be a $43.9 billion yearly industry. So meaning that industry is making almost $45 billion every year by 2025. That's not cosmetics. That's just the surgery. That's not hair, makeup, things like that. That's physical changing of my bodily appearance by going under surgical procedure. Oh, boy, this one's rough. A study by one poll showed that the average woman in her lifetime, the average woman, not, not a movie star, not a model, average woman, in her lifetime will spend oh, over a quarter of a million dollars on beauty products. The average woman. I didn't even know I could have a quarter of a million dollars. But I never will. No, okay. Oh, well, let's go to the men. A study showed that four out of five men buy, no, I'm just kidding, uh, buy beauty products. No, okay. Uh, are not satisfied with their appearance. Some men even went as far to say that they would exchange a year of their life for the perfect physique. Imagine that. They're willing to live a shorter life just so they could look good. In 2015, a poll was asked, asking the question of, does your appearance define you? This is back in 2015, almost 10 years ago. So, it's far enough. 50% of the people said, yeah, my appearance defines me. Not my job. Not my family. Not, not what I do outside of my job. Not my personality. My appearance. How I look defines me. Like, that's what defines me. That's what I want people to know me as, is my appearance. That's what they're saying. It's not just merely as this is what people think I am. No, this is they're saying. This is what defines me. Understand the implications of that. They're saying this is the most important thing about me is my appearance. 50%. It's only gone up from there. We're probably up to like 70% by now. Maybe 90. I don't know. Most people will lie about their weight above everything else. The thing most people are common to lie about is their weight. I'm 102 pounds. Right, okay. When you were born, five? Oh, he's downstairs, okay. Five? Okay. Uh, more people would rather hear physical praise of beauty and good looks than anything else. 
These, these are questions to ask the people. And most people said the thing that they would love to hear most is how beautiful they are and how good they look. That's the thing that's most important to them. When appearance becomes your everything, you're out of balance. Appearance does have its place. As God told Samuel, he says, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. That's all man can see is the outside. So your appearance is important, but it's in its proper place. You see, I should not need to worry about my outside because if my inside is correct, the outside will naturally be right. It's like a flower. If a flower is working correctly on the inside that you cannot see, the outside will be nice and beautiful. Uh, the flower doesn't, as, as, uh, as uh, I believe the psalmist of the Proverbs says, it doesn't have to toil nor spin. Or no, Jesus Christ said it about Solomon. He says the lily doesn't have to toil nor spin. It just does what it's supposed to do. And it has this beautiful appearance. That's how it should be for us. So I need to give more attention to the inner man. The inner man can give me the proper outer man. So how do we get the inner man strong? Well, the most simplest thing, the most simplest analogy is the thing you want the most strength is the thing you feed the most. If I have if I have two dogs, if I want one of them to be strong, one to be weak, I feed the one I want to be strong. So if I say I need the inner man to be strong, that means I need to feed the inner man. Walking with God, reading my Bible, doing what God has commanded me, praying. These are the ways I feed the inner man. And they will starve the old man, the outer man. The more worldliness and filth we pour into our mind, through our eyes and ears, the weaker the inner man becomes. Because we're feeding the old man. We're feeding the outer man. What our desires, our fleshly, wicked desires, we're feeding that boy to come to the world's temptations and the world's devices. And therefore, the outer man, the old man becomes strong, and the inner man grows weak because of sin and wickedness. Galatians, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, once again, as I said before, fruit doesn't have to try hard to produce. No, if the inside is right of the tree, the fruit will naturally produce. It doesn't have to work at it. It just naturally produces. So if you're feeding the inner man, you'll naturally produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's not some labor to, oh, i got to get these fruit of the Spirit. No, it's just a natural production if I am a saved individual and I am following the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What are you saying? Uh, uh, they can live lawlessly? No, what he's saying is if you're living, if these are produced in your life, you don't need the law. <laughs> law is not for law-abiding citizens. Law is for those that break the law, okay? You don't need law if people aren't breaking the law. And if you're someone that's filled with the fruit of the Spirit, what is Paul trying to say? He's saying, look, you don't even have to worry about living right if you're producing these things because it's going to be a natural byproduct. It's going to be a natural production of who you are. In order to faint not, we need to strengthen the inner man by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Secondly, chapter uh, verse 17, Ephesians 3, verse 17. First off, the inner man. Secondly, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, being sensitive to God's presence. What do you say? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I, I need to have the sensitivity to understand the presence of Christ in my life. That's imperative. If I am not, if I'm going to have the mindset of failure is not an option, then I need to have the understanding and the sensitivity to know Christ is inside of me. 
Christ is in my heart. We all know God is with us all the time. He is ever present with us. We know these things. We can say, yeah, God's always there. He's always with us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. All those good things. But Paul is praying that in this passage, not because he thinks God is not with us. That's elementary to Paul. Paul's saying, I, I know God's with you. But I want you to understand that God's with you and therefore that you'll live like God's with you. You see, when I understand something, I apply it to my life. If learning happens, then the application of the knowledge will come to fruition. If I'm trying to teach a mathematical principle in school, I, I know when learning has happened is because they can apply the new mathematical principle they've been taught. Until they do that, learning has not happened. The connection has not been made. So Paul is trying to remind them, he's trying to say, hey guys, remember, he's in your heart. You need to live like he's in your heart. You need to live like you carry him with you everywhere you go. Do you live like God is ever present with you? At work? I don't go to church, with, I don't go to work with anyone at church. Live the way I want. I don't know a thing. Oh, at home. Nobody knows what I do at home. How about in your mind? Where no one else can go. Is there a different fill in the blank with your name at Anchor Baptist Church than there is everywhere else I go and live my life? You see, because if that's the case, then I have not got it through my head that Christ is present in me. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Paul's not saying, oh, I, I need to make sure you guys have Christ in your hearts. No, he's saying, I need you to remember that whatever you do, wherever you go, Christ is in your heart and you need to act like he's in your heart. In order not to faint, we need to strengthen the inner man. I need to say, my soul is important to God, and therefore I need to strengthen, by the use of the Holy Spirit, my inner man. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to follow the commandments of God. What did Jesus Christ say? He said, if you love me, this is your, this is your litmus test if you love Christ. I love God. I love Jesus Christ. Here's your litmus test. Here's how I can know how I love Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's it. That's the one thing Jesus Christ said about if you love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. So if, I, if I'm struggling to keep the commandments of God, then that means my love for God is either non-existent or it's very weak. It's very anemic. And therefore, the inner man is very weak. So, in order to faint not, in order to have the failures not an option, I need to strengthen the inner man. Secondly, I need to have, be sensitive to God's presence. Thirdly, second part of verse 17, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Being certain of God's love. See, if failure, failure will become not even a, a possibility when I truly begin to grasp and understand the love of God. Remember, Jesus Christ is the one that said, the Father loves you as he loves me. What is he saying? He's saying the, the love God has for you is the same amount of love God Amen. has for me. God loves you just as much as he loves his pure, Amen. spotless son, Amen. Jesus Christ. That's an unbelievable thing. 
And that's why Paul is saying here in verse 18, he says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. He says, the love of God, the love of Christ is something that has dimensions to it. It's wide, it's tall, it's deep, it has dimensions to it. That's how big the love of God is. See, we need this reminder, the love of God is so powerful. God's love is what made the gospel possible. And then there would be no gospel if there was no love of God. And what does it say? John 3, 16, the first words are, for God so loved the world. Because, that's what four is. Because, because God loved the world, that's why he sent his son. If it wasn't for the love of God, there would be no happy ending. There would be no future to look forward to. But it is for the love of God. Let's go to Romans chapter number eight. God's love is what produced Calvary. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's the question Paul poses. What or who can separate us, can physically take us away from the love of Christ. He tries to answer it. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or, or famine or, or nakedness or, or peril or sword? You see, Paul could answer this question not only with his knowledge that God had given him, but he could answer this question with his own personal experience. Remember what he said in Second Corinthians he said, look, this is what I've gone through. Five times I received this. Three times I received this. I was stoned. Three nights I spent I in the deep, meaning after shipwreck. He says, I, I know these things cannot separate me from the love of God. I know they can't. Because not only because God has told me, but I have my personal experience where God did not depart from me. His love stayed true. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sleep for the slaughter. Wow. We're killed for God's sake. We're killed for Christ's sake. We're, we're accounted as sleep for the, uh, sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Oh, 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 through him that loved us. Amen. See, that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of all things God has is God's unimaginable dimensions of his love for us. It's incomprehensible. You, no matter how hard you try, will never in this lifetime understand the love of God. You can't. It's physically impossible. It's beyond our comprehension to truly understand the love of God. Because the love of God, once again, what does Jesus Christ say? God loves you as he loves me. And that's not with any addendum. That's not with any attached strings. That's all-inclusive. So that means the man that lives his life out of hatred and despising of God, God says, I still love you as much as I love my own son. His love is unconditional. No matter what I do, no matter how obstinate, no matter how wicked I may be, God says, I still love you. What does it say in verse 38? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is he trying to say? He gets all things included. Life or death. Anything you can... 
face in those two things. He says all of those. Nothing in life, nothing in death. And then he goes a step further. He then goes to the supernatural. He says the things that are beyond our control. He says nor angels, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. He says things that are happening now, things that will happen that we have no idea about, things that are beyond, out of our control, the supernatural. He says none of it has the ability to separate us from the love of Christ. You see, when I truly get that understanding, when I truly wrap my mind around the love of God, failure can't be an option. Because the love of God, as Paul said, he says, the love of God, the love of Christ constraineth me. He says, no matter what I face, no matter how bad it may get, it constrains me. Every time I think I can't take it anymore, I think of the love of Christ. And it pushes me on. I then can say, failure is not an option. See, those men with the NASA mission control, every time they thought it's hopeless, we can't get it, they would think of those three astronauts and their families and say, we've got to keep trying. As long as they're alive, we have to keep trying. That's what God asks. He says, I love you. And as long as I've given you breath, that means I still want to use you. Think about that. No matter how much you have disrespect and disregard or even hatred for God, as long as you still have breath, God says, I want you. I still want you. I still desire to use you. See, the devil knows the power of the love of Christ. The devil knows, as Paul said, the love of Christ constrains him. He understands that. So what do you think is going to be one of his number one mission is to try and stop in your mind of of remembering and understanding the love of Christ. He is going to nonstop try and make you forget, trying to convince you that God does not love you. The devil's not afraid to lie. He, He did at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. With Eve, he first did doubt and then he was outright lying. Did God really say that? And then he went outright to, no. He, he, he said it because of this. The devil's not afraid to lie to you. He must not really love you. That's what he was trying to tell Eve. Oh, he doesn't love you. He's trying to keep a good thing from you. He, he has all this knowledge that if you had, you would be like God. But he doesn't want you to have that. He doesn't really love you. No matter what happens, never doubt, never forget, God loves you. The moment you forget, the moment you doubt, you will begin to fail. The way will be. In order to faint not, in order to say failure is not an option, I must be strengthened in the end. I must be sensitive to God's presence, and I must be certain of God's love. Then back to Ephesians chapter number 3. The last part of verse number 19. Strengthen the need of man. Sensitive to God's presence. Certain of God's love. Lastly, verse 19 Last part, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. How can I not fail? How can I say failure is not an option and truly mean it and fulfill it? By being spirit-filled every moment of the day. We must give God full reign of our life. We must be full of the Spirit of God. You see, when we get saved, we get all of God. God doesn't like, "Mm, you get this little bit. No, you get the whole Holy Spirit. You get it all. He doesn't just give us a little part. He gets us all. 
one of the best ways to understand and explain the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is your heart, your heart is, a, is, a, is, a, is a house, it's a mansion, however big you want it to be. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and now he lives inside of that house. But you are still the one that holds the keys to all the rooms. Oftentimes, when we first get saved, the whole place is open to him. He can go in any room. He can go in any closet. He can check under any bed. He can do anything. He can check all the cupboards. And everything is fine because he, he's the one that saved me. But as time goes on, and as I get more used to this Christian life, and as I get more used to the love of God, as I get used to it, I begin locking some doors, putting things off the limits. Oh, Holy Spirit, you can't go there anymore. You know, you're not allowed in that room anymore. And eventually, we get to the place where we just stuff the Holy Spirit in a tiny little place and lock him in. We're still saved. He still lives inside of us, but he no longer has any authority in our lives. We have put him under the cupboard, under the stairs, and locked him in. Said, ah, you better stay there. I like living my life. To be spirit-filled, to be filled with God, we must unlock all doors, open all the closets, open all the cupboards, and give the Holy Spirit free reign. And say, there is nothing you do not have control over. It's time for spring cleaning of your heart. And the Holy Spirit wants to get rid of a lot of junk. He says, let's, let's get this out of here. Let's get this out of here. Let, let's clean this up. Let's get this garbage and filth out of here. But you have to be the one to unlock the door. First off, you have to let him out of the closet you trapped him in, you, you crushed him into. You have to let him out. And then you have to open every single door of your heart and say, what do you want to do in here? You know, many times, God just wants to know, are you going to give me the option? Are you going to give me your trust with everything you've got? Just as he did with Abraham. See, God did not want Abraham to actually kill Isaac. But he wanted to know, do you trust me enough to do it? Do you trust me enough to give me full reign, even something that doesn't make any sense at all? God just wants to know, are you really going to open every door for me? Or is there going to be some small hidden closet somewhere deep back in there that you're always still going to have a little bit of a lock on? Oh, Holy Spirit, you have all the place. But what about, he says, what about that place way back there. Oh, that's nothing. Oh, you don't want to see anything in there. How is the house of your heart? Ooh, do you even remember where you left the Holy Spirit? Do you remember what room you locked him in and said, this is your place, you just stay in there. I'm going to live my life now. How filthy has the house become? How much garbage and filth have you taken into your house? How much work is the Holy Spirit going to have when you finally let him out? And the thing is, he hasn't stopped knocking. He's still inside saying, hey, let me out. But we've turned so many things on in our lives that we no longer even notice it. See, that's the wonderful thing about God is that he never stops calling out to us. Even after we're saved. He never stops saying, hey, I want you to get better. I want you to become more like me. He's not the one that stops. We're the ones that begin to drown him out. We, we no longer want to hear the convicting call of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Wilson says this way when the, uh, when the invitation is called. He says, no response is a response. It's a decision. I decided not to respond. No decision is a decision. I decided, oh, I don't want to. When honestly, the biggest room for improvement in our, in our lives is the room for improvement. 
if we're honest. If I want to be honest with myself, the thing that I need to improve on the most is everything. I've got nothing down. Where's the Holy Spirit? Once again, the fruit of the Spirit is a natural product of someone who has the Holy Spirit having free reign in the house of their heart. You haven't locked him up, and you've unlocked all doors. He has free reign. If you have that life of strength and inner man, of being sensitive to God's presence, of being certain of God's love, and allowing the Spirit to fill you, those fruit of the Spirit will be a natural byproduct. You won't have to try at them. You won't have to say, oh, man, why don't I have love? No, it'll be a natural product of the Spirit-filled life. Just as a flower doesn't have to work and push out the flower. You don't have to work and boom, there's an apple. No, it's a natural product. That as long as everything's working right on the inside of the tree, as long as the roots are fine, as long as the tree is not rotting from the inside out, it'll produce apples. Nice, beautiful, strong apples. You see, because when the tree begins to rot from the inside out, it may look fine, looks great, but it either doesn't produce fruit or the fruit it does produce is kind of pitiful. saying that there's no blowout in the Christian life. There's only slow leaks. As someone that's worked in the entire business for many years, I can attest to it being true. Almost every single blowout isn't because you hit a pothole hard, you hit a curve real hard. It's usually because you had a slow leak and you just kept throwing it back up. See, but the problem is the sidewall of tires don't have belts and metal in them for rigidity. They're just rubble. So if you run your tires when they're too low, it'll actually start tearing up the inner sidewall of the tire. No one sees it. It looks fine on the outside. And I can keep filling that up, and I can keep filling that up, and I can keep filling that up, and one day all of a sudden it's going to boom! Yep. And everyone say, what happened? The tire was fine. Oh, you know. It was tearing you up on the inside. I put the Holy Spirit in his little place, locked him in. Oh, I know the, the filth of the house of my heart is crawling with filth. It's stacked with junk that I know shouldn't be there. But it's so loud in my heart, I can't hear the Holy Spirit. Hey, hey I want to help. I've drowned him out to be spirit filled. If is failure. If the all of those involved with the Apollo 13, the astronauts, the men at mass control, if all of them had your Christian mindset, would we have the amazing story of the success? Or, sorry guys, we can do that. Would we have this awesome victory, snatched from the jaws of defeat, the jaws of death, we saved them. If they had our Christian, our Christianity mindset, would we have that story today? Would we have that amazing event in our history? Would it? If they had your mindset, your idea of Christianity, would we have the amazing victory? Or would it be just a, another sad story of death because of lack of conviction? Because failure wasn't that big of a deal. It's just a part of life. No, no, no. Failure was not. Just as the Apostle Paul says, I, we, we cannot faint. Be not weary in well doing. We shall reap in due season if we faint not. Will you faint? Is 
is failure an option for you? If they had your mindset, Apollo 13, what would the history books say? Would it be a blip on the page of, oh, there was just another tragic event on the space age and the space race and the space discovery? Or would it be just as amazing and victorious against all odds? We brought him back home. No way it should have happened. But we were able to bring him back home. Would that be you standing in front of Christ? When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you answer for your life's work, will it be a, you were fainting or not? Failure wasn't an option to you. Or will it be, as I fear many, that will stand before Christ, a blip, a sad defeat? Because the pleasures of this present world lead you away. Be strengthened in the Lord. Be sensitive to God's presence. Be certain of God's love. And be spirit-filled every moment of the day. If failure is not an option for you, before that should be your life's mission. Every day, I strengthen you in the Lord. Every day, I am sensitive to God's presence. Every day, I am certain of God's love. And every day, I endeavor to be spirit-filled. Every moment of the day. So at the end of time, when I stand before my Savior, I can say, I did not fail. Is failure an option to you? Let's pray. Dear Father, I beg of you.